So here's what we got. There's basically two things you're going to learn today. Is how are people actually using cloud computing? What's the current market? This data is about one month old. All right, so these are the things that people are actually doing with their cloud computing, all right? So again, all this data comes from a company called Cloud Passage. I have no business or other arrangement with them, so I can discuss their data as to whether it's valid or invalid, all right? But this is what they're seeing from their company, all right? So basically what they're saying is that 41% of the people are using cloud computing for their external customer-facing sites, all right, or their customer-facing applications. So what's a customer-facing application? It's a blog, it's a company website, it's salesforce.com, right? It's Amazon in a lot of ways. It's a customer-facing site. Your customer comes in, does things, buys something, logs in, makes a new request, does something special, and then the company will take that data, move it over to a back-end system, and then go process it. All right, so you kind of have this chain here. Customer comes in, does something on the website, that is then logged, moved over to a back-end system, and then the whole fulfillment process starts. All right? So 41% of people doing this are putting their cloud infrastructure right in the hands of their customers, for good or bad. So if you think about it, who's the most dangerous person on the internet today? Your customer, right? They will do hideously stupid things with your website. They won't mean to. They really won't mean to, but they will. So 41% of people that are doing this then have to really think about their security measures, right? right? The other thing too is that means it's on 24 by seven. So you really wanna pay attention to how much this is costing you. I know I harp a lot on cost, but that's what your boss is gonna harp a lot on. All right, your boss is gonna show me the money. All right, so cost is another issue, all right? So other ways that people are using the public cloud right now, and when I say public cloud, I'm talking Azure, Amazon, Rackspace, um, GoPro, and a couple of other companies, all right? So big data, does anybody know what big data means? Big data means I'm gonna do a whole bunch of scientific research, which means I'm gonna fold proteins at home. I'm going to devise new chemistry so I can make new cool organics so I can solve some dread disease, right? So if you want to know how the HIV virus is actually built and all the DNA inside the HIV virus, that's called big data, genome sequencing. If you're working in a company like Ford, right, or you're working at GM or you're working at Amazon where you're processing thousands of transactions per second in the New York Stock Exchange, these are all considered big data objects. Right? Because you want to be able to, def to glean what's really going on inside these big data sets that uh, no, no normal human being can read. Right? The other one is e-commerce. So you sit here and you take a look at companies like eBay. You take a look at companies like Amazon. You take a look at companies like Etsy. Right? Etsy has got a huge presence in the Amazon cloud. Right? Because it's cheap, it's easy, it's a lot less than having to buy and support their own gear. Right? So when you look at something like e-commerce, you have to kind of think about, oh wait, I'm processing people's credit cards. So you have this whole other subset of data on the back end that you need to worry about and protect differently to PCI DSS than you do about your e-commerce website, which is a little bit different. Because you want it easy to use for customers. So you have to make allowances for your customers in e-commerce that you don't necessarily have to make if you're doing something else, like a big data. Right? Because your customers may be one or two people or an organization, not just the general public. And nothing against the general public, but they're a very dangerous, treacherous group of people that will harm you. Yes? So this is a breakdown of the 41%. This is a breakdown of the 41%. Right? Media, media delivery. If you look at companies like YouTube, it's a cloud-based application. If you take a look at something like Justin TV, it's a cloud-based application. Vimeo is a cloud-based application. You pay pennies for, for gigabit of bandwidth, right? There's a couple of companies out there that are pumping out 13 terabits of data a day. Now, try to imagine ordering that from AT&T, right? You don't have that cost-benefit leverage to do it. Amazon sure as heck does, but boy, you don't, right? You're just a little guy, and you're trying to pump out all this data every day. When we took a look and we actually figured out how much data that I consumed last year shoving pictures down the pipe, I personally consumed almost two terabits of data just coming off the cloud systems that I use to deliver my products. Two terabits. I didn't try wiring that into my condo, <laughs> right? Com Comcast, I don't think so. The other one I thought was really interesting is development and testing. There are companies coming up that are actually doing testing in a box. 
you can ramp up an entire test environment in the cloud and use that rather than having computers idle at home or in the office to test stuff. You can also have a much more geographically dispersed testing team. So you can have testers in China and in India and in the UK and then back in the United States all working off the same testing suite, which is really good for customer support, us usability, design, and all the rest of it. And there are companies that actually specialize in testing in a box. Right? This is basically what they call it, it's a black box, test black box testing process. Right? External apps, when you're dealing with external apps, you're dealing with things that you do like on your cell phone, right? So Foursquare would be considered an external app. I have it here, but all my data is stored over, over there. Salesforce.com, an external app, right? I have access to the data, but it's an external app. It's not hosted in my data center, right? I may have a front end, but boy, anything else past that, I don't have to worry about, all right? The other one I thought was interesting too was internal apps. So if you have people that are on the road a lot and they're doing things and need access to company specific things, sp has anybody heard of Citrix yet? Yep. Yep. So Citrix, right, is basically a remote desktop application that will t you can put it anywhere on the internet and it can tie back gracefully into your data center. Amazon Web Services and Azure are brilliant for Citrix. Right? Because you could literally pop a Citrix server in Malaysia and in Ireland and it will scale and ramp however many people you have coming in and out. If you're on the move, if you're a salesperson, having being able to log back into the company, company via your laptop via Citrix is good for data security. Right? It's low bandwidth, it's easy to manage. Right? So that would be an internal application. I log in through Citrix or I would log in like we did yesterday with our, with our Windows server right, or Windows desktop, and then access all my company internal stuff. So all my payroll, all my HR, all my internal company databases that are not exposed to the public. So kind of an interesting way on how people are using this, right? The biggies, external, the things I do outside my company, but I still have access to the data, right? Dev and testing, and e-commerce, and then internal. So they're really, companies are really starting to use this to make sure that their workforce is a lot more mobile, or that they have a lot better access to things that, they're, that they need to have. Make sense? All right? So, if a company, 36% of the respondents said they're using this to host their internal applications, what would you think of in terms of security if you're hosting your internal applications? All right, if I wanna get into IBM and I know they've got this site out here in the cloud, right? And I know that the hypervisor and, this, and the security firewall will only allow certain things through because I can poke at that and figure out what works and what doesn't work, right? Are they monitoring that thing close enough to know if I keep on coming back or if I'm rotating IP addresses or rotating through proxies, right? To know that I'm trying to get into that IBM service, right? So you need to think about that from the security viewpoint, right? Because rotating proxies is actually pretty easy to to do, right? Public cloud computing con uh, concerns, right? So they had a high concern, a medium concern, or a low concern, and they kind of broke it out into this really odd bar graph, right? So in terms of expertise, am I finding out good expertise? About 35% have a really low concern on this one. They don't care, they're okay with it, right? They believe that they have enough talent in-house to do this. Others, a good chunk, probably about 40, 45% actually really do care and they know that there's a shortage in this skill set, right? And then the other 35% are people that, oh my God, I need them now and I can't find them, all right? Cloud computing people are really expensive. When I'm working on a cloud computing gig, my charge rate's about 300 to $500 an hour depending on which company you are and how much I like you as a company. If I hate you, it's five. If I love you, it's three, all right? And consultants are like that, right? Consultants will vary their pay scale depending on how much of a pain in the ass they think you are as a client, right? So if we've got people that are really highly worried about this, this means a good job market, okay? If you have people about control, who controls the data? Who controls the access, right? If you're worried about that, a lot of people are really worried about who controls the data and why? We talked about this on Monday because of all the laws internationally, which ones apply, Patriot Act, EU, privacy laws, what about China, 
right? And all the rest of it. So this is a huge place, this is a huge market. Right? If you can come up with a way, if you can come up with a solution that's sellable, then you've now just started your own company and you're on your way to roads to, to millions, right? Or you'll get bought out, which is even cooler. Security, people are like cornering over security, okay? <laughs> because they don't know. Because the security paradigm is very different from I can walk up to it, touch it, plug cable into it, to I only see what's aimed right at that server and there's no network forensics. And so people are really worried about this. This is another huge market. So if you can do control and security, okay, now you're on your way to billions. Right? If you can come up with a product that will address these two concerns, you are good to go. Right? Add into that compliance. Right? If you can come up with a process for the cloud that includes governance, compliance, security, and control, you win. You win the game. You're the next Bill Gates. And I would love it if one of my students became the next Bill Gates because you're going to remember your old instructor fondly, right? <laughs> right? Cost. People are kind of worried about cost, not so much but not enough on the high end. If you're a high end person worrying about cost, that means you're probably getting into a four to 5,000 computer installation, right? And then it's where you need to make that trade off. What works, what doesn't work. What works in the cloud, what doesn't work in the cloud. So you need to think about these things, right? And then maturity. How mature are the solutions we have in house versus what's outside of house, right? Cloud computing, it's six years old, right? So that means it's just learning how to say no, tie its shoes, Eat with, a, eat with a fork and not smear food all over the table, right? So it's barely civilized, right? Anybody here know what a six-year-old is like in the house? All right, yes, they're barely domesticated, right? And you're gonna see that in cloud computing, it's also barely domesticated, right? There's a lot of Wild West cowboys out there. If you go through and you take a look at LinkedIn and you type in cloud computing and the word guru, there's like about 800 people that are saying, I'm a guru in this. All right, a guru should be sitting on the floor in a lotus position, Um, right? Don't believe the hype. Be very careful who you choose, right? Because there are a lot of people that say they know, but they're lucky if they can hit their hands together and clap, right? There are a lot of people missing on the marks. So when you go out there, make sure you can say that you're familiar with cloud computing. But if I see anyone use the word guru, I'll probably hunt you down myself, all right? All right, concerns about public computing, all right? We have no security concerns. I love this one. We have no security concerns. 7% of the people are blissfully, obviously happy in their way, all right? So if you have 100 computers, there's at least seven out there that are just a disaster, all right? You have seven, that's a good launch point, you're into the network, you're good to go. There was actually, this morning, there was actually an interesting alert came up in Google Webmaster Tools that there's about a dozen servers out there in the cloud right now in Amazon's cloud web services that are actually compromised with malware. So you go to those sites and it will just drive by download everything that you never wanted to have on your box. So we can thank these 7% that have no security concerns for that. Thanks, guys. All right. Data center security tools won't work in the cloud. Darn straight, right? When we start spinning up the RDS, you're gonna find out, and RDS is relational database system, right? You're gonna find out there's no command and control interface on that. You're spinning up a blind database, and you're gonna hope and pray that your database guy knows how to connect to it, right? We're gonna show you how to do all this, so there's gonna be a lot of things that we're gonna do, right? So you know how to do this when the next time your database guy goes, how do I access it? Where's my GUI, right? But the tools, no, they have a really hard time working in the cloud because it's blind. There's a lot of blind processes in cloud computing right now. Achieving compliance with PCI and other standards? Yes, because you have the data center may be compliant, but your application may not be, right? And then trying to get your auditor to understand that, no, I'm not really gonna fly you to Virginia, so you can go hang out in the Amazon data center for a couple of days and try to figure out if the data center's compliance. Here's their compliance statement. Now you just need to go through my software. A lot of auditors' brains will then tweak, and they'll freak out. What, what do you mean I can't touch it? Right, so auditors need to cap, get up to speed on this one as well. Provide access to guest servers, right? Provider access to guest servers, yes. Your provider can, under color of law, again, like we said on Monday, go through with a warrant and drag what they need to drag. For some people, that's a real worry, 
if you are a critical infrastructure information provider, right? You don't necessarily want anyone to just come in with a warrant and take my data, right? Because if I'm working on power plants, nuclear power plants, nuclear weaponry, things like that, this could be an issue, right? Lack of perimeter defenses and our network control. There are some perimeter defenses, but they're reliant on your hypervisor, they're reliant on the firewall, and they're reliant at the host base. People are so used to being able to scan the network because it's kind of an easy way of doing it without a lot of manual overhead. Host base becomes a problem. Host base is what you got in Amazon or Azure or Rackspace or anywhere else, right? So people are worried about that. So if you can come up with a solution to this, okay, you're on your way to becoming rich beyond avarice if you can do compliance, security, and all the rest of it, which I would really hope that you would rem remember me then fondly. Right? And not in your will, but early on so I can still use it. <laughs> right? Multi-tenancy of infrastructure applications. This is another interesting one. There's a couple of attacks that are extraordinarily effective against Zen Hypervisor, which is the hypervisor that Amazon uses, and Rackspace. There's also some other very effective attacks against what's going on with Azure right now, which I didn't really plan on. Right? So if I can bust out of my Zen bubble, right, my Zen space, and get into someone else's, then I've kind of broken the security model 18 different ways from sideways, right? When we were doing CIS 216 last, last term, or spring term last year, one of the students wrote a very simple command to go move files from one computer to another computer, but it started throwing serial bus errors. I should never have seen that show up on, in Amazon ever, right? It's simple, just FTP files back and forth. Right? But that indicated there was a problem with the hypervisor on security when, pass by pa when passing authentication back and forth between the two. So Amazon spent actually four months trying to figure this bad boy out until they figured out. I don't know what the solution was, but you can't get a serial bus error now coming off the, the hypervisor. But it was serious enough that Amazon took it seriously enough to spend four months working out what was wrong with this little three lines of code, right? which is why I love teaching, because you guys do things that no one <laughs> ever sees. Right? And the good part is, is that we may have averted a disaster on a big level. So that student actually did a really good job. Right? There was the same code everybody else was using. But he was the lucky one right? that got this error that no one had never seen before. So there was a potential there. All right? So service providers are addressing the security issues. Right? And they're kind of helping ease the tension that's in the marketplace right now. 23% right? Said that they were concerned about the lack of perimeter and network controls in the public cloud, but only 8% voiced fears about having access to their guest servers. So that's kind of a good thing. People are either not aware of what laws globally state, which means that their company lawyer isn't doing a good job, right? Or they've accepted that as a risk, right? If you've accepted it as a risk, it's worth doing. The cost savings is enough that I'm not going to worry about whether the government takes a poke around my data or not, right? So it kind of paints an interesting picture on where everything is going through this year and into next, I think, 2013, 2014. I think if you really kind of focus on e-commerce, dev and testing, external and internal apps, you're going to do really, really good. But if you end up in a research institution, right, big data is going to be the big primary key on that one. University of Washington alone saved something like $2 million in 2012 just by moving their big data munging out to Amazon Cloud. Right, and that's significant in a day when we're drawing down on research budgets. If you can save two million, that's a good amount of money to save. So it kind of makes sense on where cloud computing is going. All right. So this one's a little bit different. This is an actual security survey that was done early on in 2012. So the data is about a year old. All right. So this is what people were thinking a year ago. And I thought this was really kind of interesting on how they were doing it in terms of how people are doing things. How many Linux or Windows servers do you run in your data center, public or private cloud environments? So what I thought was interesting was the really, really big guys, the 5,000 plus installations, right, are a very small fraction, but you're going to find people in the 26 to 500 range doing a whole lot of stuff. So you're looking at installations between one and about 500 as your common, all right? So that's your common core. So it's a very small network in a lot of ways, 500 servers, is, is a lot, but it's not tons, right? But you have a real small common core, which you want to focus on, right? 
So if a company is saying that they're going out and doing cloud computing, they're going to start small, right? Because again, they want to make sure they work out all the bugs. So they're going to start with something small and not mission critical. And as you get more and more success in this, then you have more and more p things that they want to move out there. And it kind of grows organically. The other one I thought was interesting is how many servers are hosted with public cloud providers, right? So the projection actually was fairly true when we come back. So they projected, right, that we would have about 100 servers per company or about 100 people per company with nothing in the cloud right now. But you'd see people start migrating more and more out, right? So 1 to 25 was actually reached 100 servers. The 26 to 100 actually reached and kept on growing. The 500s, though, the 5,000s, right, that's a big commitment. Once you've committed to that provider, right, that's a big thing. And one of the things I want to talk about is what's called provider lock-in, right? This is a bane of existence for any company. I'm locked into Windows. I'm locked into Dell or Hewlett Packard because they've made me this huge deal, right? The same thing happens with cloud providers. I'm locked into Amazon. I know how it works. I programmed for it. All my APIs work. All my code works. Everything's beautiful over there in Amazon. But if Amazon should go dark, right, if you're Netflix, with all the outages they had in December, right, then you need to think about a zero rack space. So one of the things companies have been doing is what's called multi-tenancy. I'll put some stuff out here in Amazon. I'll put some stuff out here in Azure, right, to keep from being vendor locked in. Right. So when you think about that, and we'll cover some Azure, I don't have the same level of access to Azure that I do with Amazon. Right? Been working for three years to get access to Azure. I have failed. <sighs> I've even gone and talked to people over in Bellevue that actually own Azure. Oh yeah, yeah, sure, we'll make you an account. Can't get in. All right. How do you secure your cloud servers today? Manually using a checklist. Amazon Security Group, which is the groups that you guys are in. You're part of CIS 210, so you're actually part of a security group, right? You're all administrators, but I could make you a read-only guest access account, or I could turn you into something other than for that group without having to worry about it. So manually using a checklist, do you have a firewall? Why, yes, I do. It doesn't ask if it's an appropriate firewall. It doesn't ask if you have good rules on your firewall. It doesn't ask if you left everything open. Do you have a firewall, yes or no? You can honestly say you have a firewall. You can honestly say that if you try to get in SSH and your system administrator blocks off port 22, how many people are going to have a problem with SSHing in? Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> right? Uh, wrote my own automation tools. So I wrote my own automation tools to secure down servers. That's something very typically system administrator, right? We're going to be, when you, in 2.16, we're actually going to kind of split it half Linux, half Windows this year. So you're going to learn a lot of PowerShell. Right, on how to secure your server in Windows PowerShell along with how to secure your Linux server. But you're going to be writing your own tools to do all this right, as part of scripting. My provider does it for me. Does Amazon provide you with security? Does Microsoft provide you with security? You think Rackspace or GoPro is going to do the same? Right? So if they, if they think my provider does it for me, they're kind of misinformed. My provider does it for me is this guy here. Uh-huh. I love this one. We're not securing our cloud servers. Why should I bother? So a year ago, think about it, right? A year ago it was 19%. Now it's down to 7. Right? So this is a good trend. This is the kind of trend I actually like. Right? Commercial tool. There are some commercial tools out there, but they're primitive and they're hideously expensive. So it's that risk reward thing. You either can or cannot. It's up to you and it's up to the budget of the company. But there are some really, really good tools that are maturing along the way really, really quickly. They're going to make this tons easier for people down the road. Probably in about three or four years. Yes? It's, it's hard to do, though, like, with the commercial tool, right? It's not something you just install in the network because there's not physical boxes. So mm -hmm. it has to be able to touch a lot of different And it has to be able to install on the box. It has to be able to read everything that's happening to that box and then report that back securely either to uh, a storage bucket or something else. All right, and then open source or custom tool. So I'm going to trust code that uh, some open source monkey wrote. I love open source software because it's free. 
or a custom tool, right? Something that they either wrote or took an open source tool and then customized for their company, which is perfectly acceptable too, right? Okay, which cloud hosting providers do you use? And this one was really interesting because this number hasn't changed, right? Predominantly Amazon is the market, is, is the guy who owns the market with a 30% share. So this is a safe bet to learn, all right? GoGrid, Rackspace, and Terramark all basically will give you the same look and feel as Amazon, but not all the APIs, not all the services, not all the cool stuff. It's cheaper, right? Um, I actually have friends that work at Rackspace. Rackspace is a really good place to go, right? Because they actually will do a lot of neat things for you. So Rackspace is definitely a viable competitor. The other thing I thought was interesting, who's missing? Azure. Azure, Microsoft. Because it's impossible to get an account, and there's some twitches with Azure that make, it progr that make programming for it very difficult, right? Azure will brown out servers on their own, right? So you have to program for survivability. No one teaches programming for survivability, right? If you're running a high-end New York stock exchange and all of a sudden your databases start browning out, right? This is a bad thing, right? At least with Amazon, you know that the only way it's going to brown out is if a big typhoon comes and washes out the data center. Yes, ma'am. They do that because they patch and update continually across layers forward on down, right? They're, remember, Azure is different. With, with Amazon and with Terramark and Rackspace, you get the server. You own the operating system on up. With Amazon, you own layer four on up, right? So remember, you can't write to registry. You can't do a lot of things you can do when you actually have the server itself, right? Yes, sir. Yes. So with stuff like Amazon, they're not going to provide their own kind of like failover disaster prevention kind of stuff. I mean, it makes sense that they would back their data up to another center that wouldn't be affected by, mm. like, say, natural disasters. Yeah. Ultimately, who's responsible for the data? You or Amazon? That's my question. So it's ultimately, it's you. So when Netflix brand out and went dark in December because of various storms across the East Coast, right? They had a failover marker, and this is something we are going to go deep into on failing over from Virginia to like LA That's or to Oregon. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is what Netflix's problem is, and this is best of my understanding, okay? I don't have a direct line to talk to Netflix, right? But the best of my understanding is Netflix is most of their servers are on the East Coast and on the West Coast. And they do have a failover process in place that if the East Coast goes down, the West Coast is supposed to step up. But the programming logic between the two, are you there? No, I'm not here. Okay, then I'll spin up. Didn't quite work the way it intended. So there's a programmatic error in terms of failover, which meant that they had to go in and then manually do things, right, instead of it doing automated. And of course, most failures happen, what, Friday evening at 6 p.m. or on Saturday when everybody's out doing other stuff, right? So interesting. Now, Amazon Azure is actually in here, and they are actually a viable company but the problem is, is that we don't teach programmers to program for survivability. No, Microsoft is here. I may have said Amazon is here, but I really meant Microsoft is here. All right, but we really don't teach programmers how to program for that kind of survivability, right? So that's causing a few issues with Microsoft right now. Question five, and this is why I want you guys to really pay attention to what's going on with operating system. What operating system do you run in your cloud servers? Windows is still the predominant, but Linux, if you can claim Linux administration and familiarity with Amazon Cloud Services, what does that make you in the market? Really valuable. valuable. Valuable is good, right? Windows, everyone's going to pretty much so take for granted because we're raised and born with this stuff now, right? You guys don't know a world that didn't have Windows in it kind of thing. And a lot of the kids upcoming have no idea what a world without Windows is. All right, so everyone born from 1990 on forward has no idea what a world without Windows is. Think about that. <laughs> All right, so if you know Linux and Windows, if you know Linux and Windows and you've got a familiarity with cloud computing, you are extraordinarily valuable as an employee. 
which means you can actually command a little bit higher in terms of your hourly rate. But it's interesting that Linux is all the way up there, or, and that they're working in mixed environments between Linux and Windows, right? Because these numbers don't jive to just 100%, so this indicates mixed environments, some Linux, some Windows, which is not natural in a lot of, on, in a lot of home data centers. Right, if you walk into a company like Primera, or you walk into a company like Group Health, it's all the same. It's a Windows environment. But the fact that they're willing to go out and experiment in the cloud with different operating systems says an awful lot about where companies are trending. All right, the other one I really like is what web servers do you run? Well, it pretty much so is going to match what you have for operating system, right? Linux, Apache, LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, IS, right? So if you know both these web servers, you're in pretty good shape. What database management systems do you use? All right, so database, database management, MySQL and Microsoft SQL Server are the two biggies, right? Oracle doesn't even come close. It's a little over 20% in the world is Oracle right now. But, huh? What, Oracle? Oracle owns boats, and they do all that cool boat racing yacht stuff. So MySQL and Microsoft don't. So Oracle wins just because they have a boat racing team. <laughs> They're underappreciated. <laughs> all right. So MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, right? And you guys get a lot of these in the class, or in the classes that you take. But I want you to know is this little guy over here called Hadoop. Right? I desperately want you guys to learn Hadoop in this class. And the reason for it is if you're doing a big data project, if you're gonna do protein folding, if you're gonna search for space alien signals, if you're gonna go through and try to figure out what the price per commodity is on a multi-second basis, you need to understand Hadoop, right? And you are gonna learn Hadoop in this class. Because you're already learning MySQL in your Linux class, and you already have learned how to at least spin up and turn on a My, uh, Microsoft SQL server, right? But if you can do this in the cloud, even better. All right, now, what are my security concerns? Again, you'll notice that all not, this just totals up to 100, so we have multiple concerns along the way. One, multi-tenancy or infrastructure is at 38% a year ago, and it went all the way down to 19.9 a month ago. So kind of interesting. Again, this tells me that people are learning to accept that risk, right? What was the other one? Power or access or guest servers, right? So you can kind of see where these trend lines came down. So they asked the same question twice. And you can see where the trend lines came down and where the trend lines went up between last year and this year. So kind of interesting. People are learning how to respect all this and learning how to manage it a little bit better, right? So multi-tenancy of infrastructure was 38%. Lack of perimeter defenses a year ago was 44%. Provider access to guest services, 24%, where now it's way down, right? Um, compliance, 25%, but that increased, right? Enterprise cloud security tools don't work in the cloud. Of course not. Uh, we have no security concerns at that point with 16.4%, right, where it came way down. So people are actually starting to get the message. So kind of an interesting way of looking at it. And again, a year ago, I was really worrying about this. And this was one of the things that we really worked on is how can we make cloud computing security sexy, right? That's a hard one, trust me. Who's raising cloud infrastructure security issues? Who's actually bringing them up? So if your CIO comes down and says, uh, how are we secured in the cloud? The last thing you want to do is go, I don't know, I don't care, <laughs> All right, the last thing the CIO wants to hear. But your chief security information officer is asking that question at least 28% of the time. How are we securing this? It's a good question to ask. And that's a good level to ask that question because he's, is, he's in the executive suite. So he can sing the tune to the CIO, the CEO, the CFO, and all the rest of it. Is that if we're going to do this, let's at least try to do this a little bit smarter than the average bear. Right? The next person that's bringing it up is the information technology management people. So these are the people right below the CISO and the CIO. So your managers are like going, oh my God, how are we going to secure this? That's cool, you want it, but how are we going to make this so that it's not hackable right left sideways and upside down? What's really cool is that your application developers are starting to ask this question. 
application developers don't generally ask this question. They see a bunch of parameters on a page and say, oh, you want this green screen, file, blah, this, that. But they're asking the question, how do I secure it? So that's a really good welcome change, right? Executive management, CEO, CIO, all the rest of it. Customers, partners. If your customer is asking, well, how do you secure my data, right? There's two kind of line of thinking here. One, I'm a corporation and I don't share all my data with shareholders. Oh wait, you don't own stock, go away, you're bugging me, kid. Really traditional way of managing a company. The other one is to address the concern. No, this is the standards we meet, so we're PCI DSS, we're SAS 70, we're SASL, we're, I, we're ITIL, we're any one of these numbers of different ways that we've done our security and our standards. So you can give them a standard to hook on. Right? In the age of social media, you're going to want to say, no, everything's okay because I meet all these different criteria at the data center and we're having our applications blah. Right? So you can choose the old school way of, oh, you don't own stock, go away. Right? Or you can actually address your valid customer and partner concerns. Right? And then other, other people. Right? Other people are going to be like me right? because I'm going to show you a neat trick later on today about how vulnerable people are in the cloud because this ought to absolutely blow you guys away. But it's really good to kind of see that people are asking this. Um, what I thought was really interesting along the way is that the smaller the installation, the more likely that management and application developers will be concerned. So in your smaller organizations, right, it's your managers and your developers that are more concerned about cloud security, and that's a really good place to start, right? So just kind of an interesting way you can kind of see where things are today and where things were a year ago, right? So kind of makes sense? All right, now for the humor part. Oh. Please be here. All right, by the way, I'm putting all our videos out on the class here. Uh, and it's not popping this up either. All right, so let me pause this for a minute because I need to bring some stuff up. <laughs> 